If you have a copy of the scriptures, we are in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And I was honored that Errol would ask me to come and preach in his stead. I think about a year ago, he asked if something ever came up, if I could fill in for him. And it blessed me that he asked me until I realized I was really his only choice because our church meets in the afternoon, so I think he had very limited options, but I'm still honored. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We will be reading verses 1 through 10, but I'm primarily going to focus on verses 7 through 10. The Apostle Paul writes, I must go on boasting. Though there is nothing to be gained by it, I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man I will boast, but on my own behalf I will not boast, except of my weaknesses." Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So, to keep me from becoming conceited, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me, For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Let us ask the Lord's blessing on the sermon. Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to gather together and receive this good spiritual food. What a privilege it is, Lord, to be so loved and to be so blessed that you would wash us once again from every stain and defilement, that your word would just wash over us, Lord, and minister to us and instruct us and rebuke us and encourage us and all of those things that you have ordained your word to do. And so, Lord, we ask that you would give us open hearts and open ears, that you would keep us from the many distractions of the mind, that you truly would speak to us as we gather here today. Why don't you take a moment in the privacy of your own heart and ask the Lord to speak to you this morning. Our gracious Father, we know it is only because we come to you in Jesus' name that we can have fellowship with you. He is our mediator. He is our savior. He is our intercessor. He is our substitute. And we come to you in his name and you look upon your son and you say to him, with him I am well pleased. And we know that if we are joined to Christ by faith, 
that you look upon us because of the work of Christ and you say, with you I am well pleased. It is remarkable, it is wonderful, it is astonishing, it is hard to fathom, but we believe it and we receive it by faith. Please now, Lord, speak to us, we pray, in Christ's name, amen. On a shoreline in eastern Russia, just above North Korea, there is an area known locally as Glass Beach. For many years during the Soviet era, vodka, wine, and beer bottles were dumped on these shores. Huge piles of broken glass littered the coast. It not only kept locals away, but the area became closed to the public and was deemed hazardous. But after decades of pounding surf from the Pacific, the beach has been transformed. From a desolate wasteland of discarded bottles into a shoreline of colorful glass pebbles remember, resembling jewels. All of those sharp, dangerous edges have been smoothed and polished by years of oceanic force. The beach now resembles a treasure chest full of emeralds, diamonds, rubies, and sapphires. The hazard, hazard signs have been taken down, and what was once a local eyesore has become now a popular tourist attraction. And as I read about Glass Beach and the transformation there, I couldn't help but think it's a good illustration of the Christian life. Our lives before Christ are like a dumping ground, broken, hopeless, and even in some cases hazardous. But God takes such broken, hopeless, hazardous lives, and over time, through pressure and pounding, through humbling and shaping, he transforms us into divine works of art. This is what God does over time with steady amounts of pressure. And what we discover about our lives as we study the scriptures is that God ordains our ways. He orders the crashing of the waves. He ordains the pain, the disappointment, the trials, the heartache, all to transform us into something beautiful, to transform us into the image of his Son. We see this process quite clearly in the life of one of the most well-known figures in all of the Bible, the Apostle Paul. When we are first introduced to him, he was a Pharisee named Saul. And much like broken glass, Saul was hazardous. But God redeemed him, and over the course of many years, he took a man with sharp, angry edges, and he shaped him into a divine work of art to become the greatest disciple of Christ the world has ever known. Very few men suffered as much as he did for the sake of the gospel, and yet we learn that every imprisonment, every disappointment, every blow that Paul endured was ordained by God for his glory and Paul's benefit. And yet we also recognize Paul's life is not just a history lesson for us. It is not just a bit of knowledge or trivia. What is the case in Paul's life is also the case in yours. What Paul learned through his various trials, we too must learn. And that is that God's grace is sufficient for you in every circumstance, even the most painful trials of your life. Now, I never like to look at a text without considering the context, so let me just catch you up to speed on what's going on here. 
In chapter 11, Paul is defending himself against the false apostles. These were false teachers in the church who were using their influence to discredit Paul. And so they said Paul was unimpressive. They said that he didn't really love the church. They said that he was using his title of apostle for selfish gain. And so in chapter 11, Paul is forced to speak about what he has endured for the sake of Christ. If he was a fraud, why would he put up with so much suffering? If he was in it for selfish gain, why would he face imprisonment and beatings and shipwreck? If Paul was a fraud, why was he caught up to heaven to see things that no one has ever seen? This is Paul's defense. And so in verses 1 through 6 of our chapter 12, he speaks about his heavenly experience. But what I want to focus on this morning is something that God gives to Paul. Along with this revelation of heaven, God gives something to Paul which he calls a thorn in the flesh. There was something in his life given by God that greatly troubled him. And what I want us to see this morning is that in Paul's suffering, and by implication in your suffering, there is a divine purpose, and that purpose is to reveal the depths of God's grace. So we are going to focus on verses 7 through 10. Let me read for us once again verse 7. Paul says, after describing the glories of heaven, or not describing them, I should say, he says, to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Now, we all know what a thorn communicates. It's a metaphor for something painful. A thorn is something undesirable. Thorns are those things that you try to avoid. And the picture here is that something in Paul's life is producing much pain. But I want you to notice something here. It doesn't say he merely had a thorn, as if that was just bad luck. But in verse 7, it says, he was given a thorn. Do you see that in your Bible? A thorn was given me in the flesh. Now, was given is a passive verb, and Bible scholars unanimously recognize that this is a divine passive, meaning the unnamed giver is God himself. So Paul was given a thorn by God, which he calls a messenger of Satan. Now, what was Paul's thorn? That's the question everyone wants to know. And people have lots of different theories. Some believe it was something circumstantial in Paul's life. Maybe it was the Judaizers who he's written about elsewhere. These were believers in Christ, at least they professed faith in Christ, but they kept trying to put people under the Old Testament law. And they were a constant source of frustration for Paul. Maybe it's the false apostles that he refers to in chapter 11, or maybe it's something else, other circumstances we don't know about. Other theories are this was a spiritual struggle, some believe it was depression. Paul struggled with depression. Some believe it was lust. This was this thing that constantly was afflicting him. Martin Luther believed it was despair. Others believe it was demonic oppression. I mean, he does call it a messenger of Satan. And still others would put it in the category of something physical. So Paul suffered from headaches or eye trouble or epilepsy, or malaria, or gallstones, these are real theories, or gout, or speech impediment. 
One dude said it was hair loss. <laughs> now, I think that's the time when you take a break from the office and just go for a walk, you know? But whatever it is, we can be certain of one thing. We do not know. And I will go even further to say that it is by God's design that we do not know. God could have told us if he wanted to. He could have inspired the Apostle Paul to write all about his particular affliction and be very specific. But he didn't. And there's a wonderful reason for that. God wanted it to be open-ended because, as Pastor Heath Lambert writes, it is an invitation to make this passage your own. By leaving it open-ended, it becomes an invitation to see the thorn as a general expression of all kinds of troubles. Troubles you might be facing today. Imagine how less effective this passage would be if Paul was specific. Let's say he was suffering from gout. And you read that chapter on Paul's gout and you say, Well, if I ever have gout, I know what chapter to read. How could that bring you comfort in your present trial? But if God writes it in general terms, you can interpret that thorn to be many different things. The thorn in the flesh could be what you're enduring right now, and that is the point. We don't know what the thorn was, but we do know why Paul received it. In fact, he tells us twice in verse 7. He says, so to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Do you see it there twice? So Paul describes this experience of being caught up into heaven. Verses 1 through 6, he says, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. He talks about it as if it wasn't him, but the reader starts to pick up on that it was him. And Paul experiences what very few in all of history have experienced. So the Apostle John had a vision into heaven. Ezekiel had a vision of heaven. Uh, Isaiah had a vision of heaven. Paul actually went there. And yet, along with this knowledge that Paul is given through this experience, God gave something to Paul to keep him humble, this thorn. Now, the scripture says that God opposes the proud and he gives grace to the humble. And so to keep Paul in a state of maximal usefulness to God, he lovingly gives him this thorn to humble him. And if God so loves Paul to bring into his life some frustration to keep him humble, he may do the very same thing with you. The thorn, whatever it is, has a wonderful purpose. It's like the crashing waves on the shards of broken glass. The thorn God gives is not to punish, but to purify. Now, there's something about pain that we all run from, isn't there? I don't know anyone who delights in suffering, who goes through a trial and, and, and really just enjoys that kind of affliction. And lest you be tempted to think it doesn't bother the super spiritual, like there's people out there that are so spiritual it doesn't even phase them. Think again. Look at verse 8. Here's super spiritual Paul. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. So Paul pleads with the Lord to take away this thing that is afflicting him. Because Paul is like you, and when suffering enters in, we want to find a way out. Right? So Paul 
was not floating three feet above the ground. He did not have a golden ring hovering over his head. He is just like you. He does not like to suffer. And so he pleads with God, just like you do, help, help me, Lord, three times. And God says, no. Paul wanted God to take it away, and God says no. But he says in verse 9, He said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So God says no, but it's not just no, and he leaves it at that. He explains that what he has given Paul is sufficient And Paul, being in a place of weakness, is where he can discover the sufficiency of God's grace. So the thorns of life become the place where you discover the extent of God's grace. Now, there is a false teaching in our day that says that it's never God's will for you to suffer. It's never God's will for you to be sick. It's never God's will for you to be poor. And if you suffer from any of these things, it is a lack of faith. And a lot of these men and women are on television convincing people that that's true. That is a lie from the pit. God says no to giving Paul relief from his pain because he wants to give Paul something more wonderful than relief from his pain. He wants to show Paul the extent of his grace. Now, what does grace mean? I mean, this is Grace Bible Church. I'm sure if I surveyed you, you are all very well aware of the definitions of grace. Some of you might say it's undeserved kindness. Some might say it's unmerited favor. Some might say it's something we don't deserve. Some might say it's a gift from God that cannot be earned. And if you're really clever and you use the acrostic, God's riches at Christ's expense. But if we're looking at verse 9 here, It must mean more than those definitions. Like, so so check this out. God is saying, no, Paul, the painful thorn will remain, but what I will do for you instead is allow you to experience my grace. So if our definition of grace is, well, God giving me something I don't deserve, some kind of blessing... And if I think grace is the removal of pain, then maybe something's wrong with my definition here because it's not comporting with what I see with Paul. In verse 9, Paul is saying that God's grace is allowing the thorn to remain. Tell me you see that in your Bible right now. God's grace in the life of Paul is allowing the thorn to remain which makes me wonder if our standard definition of grace is incomplete. In our remaining time, I want to make four observations that we can learn about God's grace. Now, fear not, these are very short. If you're sitting there thinking, Alice, this is the introduction. He's just getting to the points now. Don't worry. Nice and short. In fact, I will make a confession. These are not even my points. I borrowed these from a very helpful article I read by Heath Lambert. And, you know, you read some other men sometime and you think, that's a better outline than I had. So I'm just going to go with his skeleton and sort of fill in the flesh parts. Point number one, grace is not the removal of pain. Okay? Grace is not the removal of pain. If God says no to your relief and no to the removal of pain, but instead says, I will give you my grace to sustain you, 
then that means whatever grace is here, it is not the removal of pain. Now, don't we tend to think that the removal of pain is God's grace? Oh, man, the Lord was gracious to me. Whew, when I had those kidney stones, I'm all better now. Man, God was gracious to me. So we think of God being gracious to us is his relieving us from suffering, not allowing us to remain in our suffering. Who says, man, God was gracious to me. The kidney stones are killing me. <laughs> Just doesn't sound right. But that is what we have here. A thorn is given to Paul. Paul pleads with the Lord to remove it. The Lord doesn't remove it. And the leaving of the thorn is called grace. Now, this not only goes against that false notion that God always wants you to be healthy, wealthy, and happy, but it also reminds us that God's kindness to us might appear in the form of affliction. Like, we are not to, to have some trial or some calamity in our life, some thorn, and think, why is God punishing me? This could be God loving you. And if he chooses you for that, it is so that you might have a greater understanding of his grace. And what I get from this passage is that there is a kind of grace that can only be known through the thorns of life. Right? You're not learning the depths of God's grace when your toes are in the sand and you've got a margarita in your hand and everything is right in the world. No, it's when you're stabbed in the back by a friend. It's when uh, your marriage is on the rocks. It's when there's emotional heartache and there's loss. In 2006, my wife and I had been married two years, and we were expecting our first child. And so the 20-week ultrasound came around, and we're excited are we going to have a boy? Are we going to have a girl? And we go to that appointment and we discover that we are having a very sick child. Nathan had spina bifida, cleft lip and palate, a heart condition. He had extra digits on his hands and toes, his hands and his feet. His cranium was smaller than normal, and you put all of these factors together, and it's a condition called trisomy 13. And I remember very clearly the next few nights. I just remember going downstairs in our living room and just sitting in the dark in the middle of the night. And I was so devastated. My heart was so heavy. What if my son dies? What if my son lives? I mean, this is way, way too big for me to handle, Lord. And there was something about the sense of that crushing weight that I just had a closeness to God in that time. Like, I had a closeness to God that I had not known before. And it was painful and yet I discovered the grace of God in the midst of that pain. And so for months where my wife, you know, she goes to full term and she was a little bit early, I think eight, eight months, eight and a half months, and the baby's born and, and we loved him and he died an hour and a half later and, and we can look back on that whole experience and say, look how God was with us. Look how he was with us. Look how he, he crafted this whole, this whole series of events to bring about his glory. And part of that glory is my knowing him and my wife's knowing him. Part of God's glory was that changed the trajectory of our entire life. Because I preached at his memorial and... That's when men in my church approached me and said, you might have some kind of preaching gift. You might want to consider seminary. And so I don't look back on these trials and think, oh, 
well, God left me there. God abandoned me there. It was like, no, that's where I came to know him. <laughs> is that your definition of grace? <laughs> I mean, is that how you think about grace, the grace of God, when you are in the bottom in the most pain you've ever known? Because I'm reading this chapter and Paul is suffering and this is the Apostle Paul and he is crying out to God. It's like he's writing the scripture. He knows the Lord has given it to him, but at the same time he's asking God to take it away. And yet through that whole process he discovers this thing called grace. So maybe we could say, grace is what God gives you when he takes away the pain, but grace is also what he gives you when he lets the pain remain, <laughs> when he doesn't take it away. We can call that grace too, because God is up to something, and he's up to something good. He says in verse 9, my grace is sufficient for you. So that means God's grace is present when a child dies. God's grace is present when a spouse leaves. God's grace is there when you get that phone call from the doctor you've been dreading. God's grace is there when wave upon wave of trouble just crashes over you. Grace is there and it is sufficient. So then... Grace must be defined as God's active disposition toward you, his good intention, his disposition towards you that is of blessing, of goodness, is of your benefit. Maybe that is what grace is. Because sometimes God will show grace by removing the pain, but sometimes God will show grace by allowing it to remain. But if we know that behind the scenes there is a God who is always looking out for my best interests, always working toward my benefit, then maybe that is how we define grace. If you think grace is the removal of pain, then when life gets really hard, you will falsely interpret that as God letting you down. But grace is not the removal of pain. Secondly, grace is the receiving of power in the midst of pain. Again, verse 9. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So what God says to Paul here is that his power is equivalent to his grace. He says, no, I will not deliver you from this thorn, but I will give you grace, which is my power. So grace is not only God's favor towards you, his, his good disposition towards you. It is an expression of his power. It is God lifting you up in the midst of your suffering. And what God does with his people is sustain them by his power and renew them not by changing their circumstances. Not by changing their circumstances. He might, but he might not. But by giving you his power to carry you through all the various trials. It makes me think of Isaiah 40, verses 30 and 31. He says, Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So it's the same idea here. It's a picture of the young and the strong collapsing under the weight of their trials. And here you have the weak and dependent finding this kind of supernatural strength. That's what Paul is talking about here. 
the Lord granted Paul relief, not by removing his suffering, but by giving him sufficient power to sustain him. Now, our problem is, we usually just want relief. Isn't that true? When you get into some kind of trial, don't you just want the trial to end? I mean, I find that so much of my energy is focused on how can I get this to end rather than looking for God's power. So we look for relief and the world offers us all kinds of relief. Run to this, run to that, take this, drink that, smoke that, watch this. We often want relief more than we want power. Rather than experiencing God's power in a difficult marriage, it's so much easier to just escape it. More than wanting to see God deliver you from temptation, it's just so much easier to give in. Rather than waiting on the Lord, you just want to take control and do it your way. Too often we want relief, not power. Paul discovered God's power. So grace is not the removal of pain. Grace is the receiving of power. Thirdly, this kind of grace is only for those who are weak. This kind of grace is only for those who are weak. Again, verse 9, he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now, you and I have a desire to be perceived as strong. That is human nature. Look at the world we live in. It's all about strength and beauty. Look at the magazine rack as you're checking out at the supermarkets. Look at television and movies. Strength and beauty. It's how you and I want to present ourselves to the world. When you choose a profile picture on Facebook, you take that very seriously. You are looking through 50 pictures. No, that doesn't look like me. That doesn't look like me. That doesn't look like me. And that rare shot where you look completely amazing, you're like, that's the one I'm using, right? <laughs> no one wants to, picture, uh, to choose the picture when they just woke up or they just got done crying. We want to present ourselves to the world as a picture of strength. We want people to think we have it all together. This is true on Sunday mornings. I hate to say it. Sunday mornings we gather together and we want to show ourselves off as people who have it all together. And there are those rare and wonderful churches where people are very open and they're praying for each other and they're crying on each other's shoulders and they're sharing their greatest temptations and they're sharing their greatest burdens. But so many times it's just the handshake, the pat on the back, good to see you again, and there's none of that sharing. Maybe it's different here, I hope so. But because we have this tendency to portray strength in ourselves, it's hard for us to relate to what Paul is saying here. I mean, we hide our weaknesses, we boast of our strengths, and Paul is talking about boasting in weakness. Like, how do you even do that? Boasting comes naturally to us, and what doesn't come naturally to us is being exposed, and even further than that, boasting in that. Now, the reason Paul could boast in his weakness is because of what God does with that weakness. 
That's the whole point. I'm going to make a confession here. I wasn't going to share this. I took it out of my notes, but I'm going to say it anyway. So I do not feel very comfortable being in front of crowds, okay? They call that an introvert. I check all the boxes of introvert. I like small groups, very small groups, and the larger the group, the more uncomfortable I feel by nature. So God gives me his Holy Spirit. He gives me a desire to teach his word. He gives me a gift of teaching, I think. And he says, I want you to go up there and do it. And I'm thinking, you want me to go up there and do that? And so the first time I ever preached, I was terrified. I mean, beyond terrified. Think swimming with sharks or dangling over the top of a skyscraper. I mean, I was terrified. And so I get into this place of fear where I'm like, Lord, if you don't show up here, I'm just going to die. I'm going to die up there. And so he shows me his grace by giving me his strength, and he gives me his power, and I preach his word. And I'm like, wow. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for letting me do that. Thank you for letting me experience that. And then he's like, okay, you have to do it again next week. I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> and so over this course of weeks and months and years of doing the most uncomfortable thing to me that I can imagine, God is showing me his grace through his power, which sustains me to do the work that he's called me to do. So I wonder if you have ever had to do something for God that just terrifies you, and you're like, Lord, if you don't show up, I'm going to die. That's Paul in 2 Corinthians 12. He's like, Lord, if you don't show up in the midst of this affliction, I'm going to die. And God does show up with his power. And so that's why Paul can boast in his weakness, because the weakness is what brings about the power. There's a wonderful Old Testament picture of this in Judges chapter 7. Gideon is called to defeat the enemies of Israel, and so he gets this great army together, 32,000 fighting men, and God says that's way too many. And so through this process, he whittles it down to 10,000, and God says that's way too many. And he gets it down to 300. He's going to fight the Midianite army with 300 men. And God tells him why. He says in Judges 7 2, The people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel boast over me, saying, My own hand has saved me. So God wants to show off his power in your weakness because you have a natural tendency to boast in your strength. And so God might give you a thorn to humble you. It is a wave that crashes over you. And this is God giving you his grace. Because if you think of any area of your life, and if you have an attitude like, I got this, it would be unloving for God to leave you in that place. Because God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. So Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So grace is not the removal of pain. Grace is the receiving of power. This grace is only available when you admit that you are weak. And number four, which is my favorite, None of this is about you anyway. <laughs> Don't we need to hear that over and over and over? None of this is about you anyway. Look at verse 10. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So Paul says he's content with the thorn, with the suffering, with the affliction. Why? Because his weakness 
is for Christ and about Christ. It wasn't about Paul. It wasn't about his strength. It wasn't about his great learning under Gamaliel. It wasn't about his position. It wasn't about his influence or his apostleship. It was about Christ the whole time. Colossians 1.16 says, All things were created through him and for him. That means it's not about you. That means when we get to the end of your life, when all is gone and all is finished, when life is over and your whole life is seen, you're going to discover it wasn't about you. It was about him. It was about his life in you. The praises of heaven are going to be God telling his story through all of his people. And so it's not going to be so much your story as it will be his story. Look how God took that shard of broken glass and made it into a diamond. That's going to be your story. And if anything, thorns are a reminder to us that this life isn't about us. We don't have control over anything. Isn't that humbling? You have the illusion of control in your life, and it's just that. It's an illusion. You don't have control over anything, and that is what is often painful about these thorns. Pain hurts because it hurts to be reminded of this. But if your attitude is that you are here for Christ's sake, and that is to be your attitude then whatever comes your way is all right because he is the one that does have control. And that means thorns are from him and that means they have a wonderful purpose to conform us to his image. Isn't that good news? That is great news. It doesn't mean you don't ask him to take it away. It just means you don't fall to pieces if he doesn't. You can actually praise him if he doesn't because he's up to something and he's up to something good. And if you want to be like Jesus, then you can boast in what God is doing in your pain. Take away my comforts. Take away my earthly pleasures. Take away those things I cling to so closely in this life. But give me Christ. And if it takes a thorn to get there, oh God, help me to embrace it. As we close, think about those rough areas of your life that need to be smoothed out. I have good news for you today. God is at work in that today. He is in work, at work in that right now. And a day is coming. A day, a glorious day is coming. Maybe soon. We will look around. We will be gathered around his throne. And as we look around, we will see the glory that God brought out of each of our lives. Heaven's shore will resemble a treasure chest of emeralds, diamonds, rubies, and sapphires. All breathtaking as they display the glory of God. And we will discover that every trial, every temptation, every difficulty, every affliction, it was all worth it. Broken lives smashed on the shores of this world, pounded by the waves of affliction, and it will be quite a transformation. All those rough edges gone, and we will shine, as it says in Daniel 12, like stars forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, it is such good news.
that you never stop loving us. You never stop giving to us. Whether you give or whether you take away, it is still you giving. And you give us the greatest gift imaginable, Lord. You conform us to the image of your very Son, that we would be conformed to his likeness, that we will be glorified with you, and that we will demonstrate and reflect your glory forever and ever. Oh, may this encourage your saints this week as we go through the thorns of life. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 